morning. morning. Well, it's lovely to be with you this morning, and I just want to clarify what the B-E-M really stands for. (laughs) Barmy Englishman. (laughs) Uh, Congratulations, Brian and Stella, and for all the staff that have worked there, it's it's marvellous. We honour them. And uh, we are so grateful for God to have them as part of us as a, as a church. Well, we're in, as uh, Devation said, we are, I, I just might add, I was on that safari with Devation. Um, it was a bit of a scary time. Um, and I'd love to go into that if you invite me for a barbecue this afternoon. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, but uh, where was I? Yes, third, third week of the series. And uh, the first week we looked at David as a 15-year-old young man and his courage, uh, his tenacity, his faith in God. And then last week we looked at David um, when he was on the run from Saul and he had been anointed to be king. Uh, So he knew what his destiny was in God, but yet he was on the run and as a result of that, of his Uh, sense of being alone and abandoned and afraid, he um, made some terrible mistakes which actually cost the the lives of many innocent people. And uh, this week we come to him still in this on-the-run period where he is um, like a seven, eight-year period in which he is still on the run. He's... um, um, not able to kind of, he's, he's not at home or welcome in Israel and uh, he's not welcome in any other country. So he's kind of a nomad and he's in between where he wants to be, doesn't really in some ways belong anywhere. So that's where he is in his thing. But the story we're going to look at today, um, he's about to make another terrible mistake. But he is saved by a woman. And I know you're thinking, but it's not Mother's Day. (laughs) So this is for Mother's Day, okay? (laughs) Whenever that appears in the calendar. Um, And so he's on the verge today in our story of making another terrible mistake. What I find happens is, is once you start making bad decisions, it tends to be a downward spiral. You, you end up making one bad decision and then another bad decision and you end up into a right mess and into a fix, which is of your own doing. It's not because, you might, you might blame the circumstances and the situation, but David still could make good decisions even though he was um, ousted by the king of Israel at the time. But he was saved by a woman. I wonder how many men are here who have been saved by a woman. (laughs) Yes, all the guys go, absolutely. Uh, We have been saved many a time uh, because of our wives or people that uh, we would wish were our wives. No, there you go. Um, That's for all the single guys, yes. (laughs) Um, I just want to ask a question. Do we get what we deserve? David is in this scenario that we're going to look at today. But it's a big question to think, do we get what we deserve? Should we get what we deserve? I don't know about you, but I don't want to get what I deserve. But I do want other people to get (laughs) what they deserve. Anybody else with me on that one? uh, We're often like that, we yes. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a world without consequences. But yet I don't want to suffer the consequences of my actions. There's a dilemma there, isn't there? In other words, what I want to happen to me is not what I necessarily want to happen to you. And you're thinking exactly the same, probably about me. And so we have the golden rule. What is the golden rule? 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's right. That's the golden rule, isn't it? The golden rule is a biblical rule, yes, and, uh, and it's in the Bible. It comes from the Bible. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Until, of course, someone mis- mis- mistreats you, and then, of course, we change the rule, <laughs> yes, and the rule becomes very different when it applies to us, yes, it becomes what do unto others as they have done unto you, <laughs> becomes the change, don't we? We come, I, no, this is what they did to me, they hurt me, so I'm going to hurt them back. Now, if you're in any doubt that there is a universal moral code, this should be one that shows you, that confirms to you that there is a universal moral code. Because wherever you go in the world, universally, everybody believes that other people that have hurt them should get what they deserve. There's, everybody believes that there should be consequences to actions. Yes? About what is happening to them. So we've got to understand that we don't act the same, but we do often react the same. So when we're hurt, when we've been offended, when somebody has done something to us, to retaliate, to try to get even, seems very natural. It feels right. It feels good. It feels that sense of, I need to get even that it's something that we should be, should be do. Yes? I believe that's so important on us. So when people mistreat us, we believe that we sh- are in the right to mistreat them back. In other words, it's the Old Testament principle of an eye for an eye. Yes? A tooth for a tooth. A jelly full of <laughs> welly. A welly full of jelly. That's the right way around. Yes, for a welly full of jelly, as it were. And so we've got to understand this. Now, the thing is, I've found in life that often we find that we are mistreated by people who are in power over us, so we feel powerless to be able to retaliate and to get even. So what happens is, and I see this all the time, is that 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 person that feels powerless in that situation, whatever that be, it might be at work, say for example, and they feel powerless with their boss, they can't get even. So what they do is they take it into another environment, another situation, or with another person who they do have power over, and they misuse that power and they want to get even. But because they can't get even with the person who has mistreated them, they mistreat someone else. It's like like in a football team, it's substitution. Yes, it's like what Jesus did on the cross. He took our price, didn't he? He took the penalty for us. It's like we want to punish somebody. The person we want to punish, we can't punish. So we end up, and that's why you see abuse in marriages, you see abuse for for children, you see abuse in the workplace, you see this uh, mistreatment of people because people are trying to get even. And so we see that. And so that is important for us, I think, to understand. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be taken advantage of. And I'm sure you're in the same situation. So when I am taken advantage of, my natural response is to get even, to get them back, to kind of even the score, I want to kind of strike back. Now, I know you're, none of you are ever thinking like that, okay? It's just me and my sinful nature. For one of the reasons is I don't want to feel that I look weak, that I'm, that I, I'm vulnerable and that I'm an easy target, yes, that people can just walk all over me. And so I'm sure for all of you, you have a backstory 
in which you have been mistreated, you have been maybe abused, you have been hurt, you've been offended, you've been abandoned, you've been something or other in your life where someone has, has you know, done something to you or responded to you in a way that you don't deserve. The problem with getting even is that you're trying to get even with someone who you don't even like. Did you get that? You're trying to get even with someone you don't even like. And what that happens is, is you get even, it actually means that you are, where, where, for example, if you think even means to be on the same level. So someone hurts you, you come from being hurt to down to their level of being even. So whenever you try to get even, you stop being and you become so it's so important for us to realize that because what we feel is, is that when they hurt us, that we're there and we want to get there. But when we are mistreated, the actual fact that we are, we are the one being mistreated, we have got the, on the high road and, and uh, we want to get even, brings us down to their level. When we mistreat someone else, even if they have mistreated us, it brings us down to their level level in life. It actually gives them control over your life. They're like manipulating, they're controlling you. And so what it does, it sets you back in your life because you're busy trying to get even because of the grudge and uh, the bitterness and the hurt that's in your life. Hurt people hurt people. So in part three of our study today, we are going back to the life of King David, who about 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years BC, um, this warrior, this giant slayer that we saw in week one, a folk here, now a fugitive, now on the run. And so we see him in this period of his life where he has recovered from a bad mistake. He has sought the Lord again. He's got himself, he's apologized. He's, he's repented of what he's done. And he's about to make another terrible mistake. And that's where we come into this story in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And so I want to read this chapter or most of this chapter and just make some points as we go through this chapter. So in verse 2, it says, A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. This is an important part, is to understand he is shearing at a, in Carmel. He, it is the time of shearing. So put that into a modern context. This was the time when it would be kind of you understand whether you're, you have, uh, if you're a business, you're, financially have you made a profit? This is your time when you balance the books and you see. So in other words, when he was able to shear the sheep, he was able to see all the bounty of what he had, what he had, he had throughout the year. So the looking after the sheep and paying the herdsmen to look after the sheep and feeding the sheep, whatever was involved in it and keeping things going, this was a season for celebration. This is a season for shearing the sheep. Yes, this is bonus time. Yes, for those of you that work for a company, we, you look forward to bonus time. Yes, the, the firm's done well, you've worked hard, you've done well and there's a bonus, yes? So it's saying that this guy is wealthy. Yes, he is, he's wealthy. In the, in, the, in, the, in the time that he's talking about, he is doing that. He's turned a massive profit. And verse 3 says, His name was Nabal and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman. But her husband was surely and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. Now, surly means harsh. It literally means heavy. So it means to be abrupt, to be discourteous, to be disagreeable, to, 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 not, to be someone people dislike, okay? People don't want to be with him. His name actually meant fool. Nabal 
means fool. So nobody liked him. Verse 4, while David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep. He'd come into the good money. It was celebration time, bonus time. So he sent 10 young men and said to them, go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. So they knew who was sending them, yes? Everybody in Israel knew who David was, yes? He's not, he's not some obscure guy like me. This is a guy that's a national hero, okay? Although he's on the run. And he says to them, he said, say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. In other words, we were a hedge of protection around them. We protected what was yours. We could have, because I'm a fugitive and I'm on the run, I could have well easily taken advantage of that. I have uh, many, many fighting warriors with me. At any point, I could have taken what sheep or cattle that I wanted, but he didn't. Yes, so he's saying, I looked after you, I blessed you, protected your guys. I, you know, surely you can just offer something in response just to kind of, uh, as a little thank you at this time. Yes, so you can get the this, 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 this seriousness. And so he said, ask your servants and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable towards my men since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David wherever you can find for them. Yes? In other words, since we've been good to you, be good to me. Yes? Because we've kind of been generous towards you and blessed you, bless us and that. Yes? So this is what he's gone to Nabal with in this. So verse 9, when David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited for the response. And Nabal answered David's servants, who is this David? Knowing full well he knows who this David is. <laughs> yes. Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. You see, he knew David was a, a fugitive. He knew he was an outlaw. He knew he, he was classed as a rogue in the land. Yes, I didn't ask for his help. He, he might have given it, but I didn't ask for it. And so his, his attitude was, I don't owe him. And he says in verse 11, why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. David said to the men, each of you strap on your sword. So they did. And David strapped on his sword as well. I want to say to you, first of all, that self-control is a muscle. And just like any muscle, it can be worn out. Yes? Uh, it, can be, it can be broken, as it were. It can be stretched beyond where it, 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 its capacity. So, for example, a few weeks ago, I was lifting the couch. But instead of lifting the couch, uh, like in, in, in an upward motion... I was laid down trying to get this carpet out from underneath it and I lifted that and I could hear the muscles tear. It didn't really hurt so much, it was more just I could hear it and so it was actually a day or two later before it started to hurt. And so it still hurts now and certain moves actually are painful. So just like a muscle, so our patience can wear out. So uh, our, our self-control can wear out. And David's self-control had worn out. It was, he was at the end of his tether, as it were. He'd had enough. He was frustrated. He had, he had been good to this guy. And, uh, and he was now, he felt being mistreated and misunderstood. And so it's important to understand that at this, this is where... Uh, David was on this. He's got to his last straw, frustrated, and he's about to unleash him and his men on a lot of innocent people. Yes, because he is not just going for Nabal, he's going for everybody, right? And you can imagine here 
that as David has got, he strapped his sword on, he is, yes, he's, you know, he's misdirected in what he's wanting to do, but hurt people, hurt people. Hunted people, hunt people. And so this was what David was. And so it says about 400 men went up with David while 200 stayed with the supplies. I would have been one of the guys staying with the supplies, okay? <laughs> yes, just letting you know there, yeah? Verse 14, one of the servants told Abigail, um, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us, and the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day they were a wall around us. Uh, The whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do. Because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Abigail acted quickly. There's something about acting quickly. Doing the right thing quickly. Because had she hesitated, had she said, well, I'll think about it, it would have been a very different story. And sometimes we've got to understand God expects us to act quickly. What does God want us to act? Quickly, absolutely. She took, now this is an amazing thing, I think. There's only a woman could do this. Yes, she took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five measures of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisin and 200 cakes of fresh uh, uh, pressed figs and loaded them on donkeys. This must have been Claire. Yes, she would be the only one I think that could, could pull, this, pull this together. Yes, someone like that that's just really kind of, she, how she does it, I have no idea. Then she told her servants, just listen to this woman and the, the, the wisdom, the astuteness of Abigail. Yes? She's in the AA. Astute Abigail. Okay. She, she, she's done this. Then she told her servants, go on ahead. I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. There was some wisdom in that. Yes? Because if she'd have told him, he'd have probably reacted in a nasty way and stopped her going. So she went ahead. As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending towards her, and she met them. You've got to imagine there that David is coming with his 600 men, or maybe 400 out of the 600, yes, all armed to the teeth. And they are frustrated, they are angry, and they want vengeance. They want to, to, to get their own back. They want to get even. Yes, because of this. So you've got to understand that. Now, Abigail is coming to meet David on her little donkey. Yes, and she's kind of coming. Can you imagine that scenario? It's like a Wild West um, thing, isn't it? You know, if you've ever you've looked at the Wild West and they're coming, charging through the ravine and there's this lowly woman on her own and she comes and meets the men, and how does she respond to this man who is coming to butcher her, her husband and her whole household? Because that's what his aim is, and she understands what his aim is. She is not daft about that. So this is what he says. David had just said, verse 21, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for... What is he paid back? Evil Evil for good. And then verse 22, may God deal... Keep that in your mind, evil for good. That's that's what uh, Nabal has done to David, yes? Verse 22, may God deal with David, be it ever so severely. If by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. Wow. Here's a wealthy woman. Yes, this is strange. This is not what you would expect from a wealthy woman to get off her donkey and to bow before David. And you've got to think, the courage of this woman 
you know, the natural thing would be to flee for her life. But she doesn't. She faces David, who's an outlaw, he's kind of fugitive, he's, he's, he's after vengeance. And she bows down before him. I want to say to you, I think that caught him off his guard. I think that surprised David. I think he wasn't expecting this. He wasn't looking for this. He is, he is, he is I think as he's journeying along and he's going on his donkey, I think his mind's making more and more reasons why he needs to get even. Yeah? The, the longer it goes on, the longer the journey, the nearer he gets, the more the emotional tension and frustration and anger in him is building up. And, uh, and so she, she does this, but what we find is that she treats David as if he's already the man she hopes he will become. She doesn't treat him as he is responding, as he is angry, as he is, he is. But she treats him as the man she knows he can become and he should become and he's anointed to become. Because Abigail, as all in Israel would have known, he was anointed to be king. So Dave, you can imagine David's frustration because he's, a, he's an outlaw and he's not getting treated well by, by Nabal who he's looked after, but his rightful place was in the palace. His rightful place was as a son-in-law son of the king. That's where he should have been at home in his comforts, but he's not. So you can imagine all this kind of thing working in him. So I just want you to know, and particularly you ladies, to take note that when Abigail talks to David, the way she talks to David works for all, our guy, all the guys. Because when you butter us up and you say, you know, Kath says, I bet you could take that rubbish bin out with one arm. And I go, I bet I can. <laughs> now I know I can, but I've got to, I've got to show her. So I'm just saying, ladies, that's the way your guys are built. So you treat us as we, you want us to be, and you speak into our future as Abigail spoke into David's future. I want to say to you, you will have men of the future who will be as you want them to be. There won't be men who are trying to get even. There won't be men who will be doing bad and evil for good. They will be men who will be different again and they will take the high road and do good for evil. And so this is what she says to him. She says to him, she, she's speaking to David's potential, uh, looking past what he's about to do, yeah? Because she knows the stupidity of what he's about to do and that he can never return from what he's about to do. It would always be in his story. It would always be part of who he was at that time. He could not reverse that decision if he went ahead with it. And so she said, verse 24, she fell at his feet and says, pardon your servant, my Lord. Hear what your servant has to say. First of all, she's not his, his servant. Yeah, she's not his servant, but she chooses to, to have a servant heart. She chooses to take the posture of a servant because she knows what's at stake. She knows what lies ahead because in this moment, she is the one who is pleading for a change in David so that he will act as he ought to act and not as he is intending to act. Yes? So, I just want, first of all, ladies, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. Okay? I don't want you to hear that I'm saying here that all the ladies should be bowing down before the guys or before your husband or whatever. I'm not saying that. Now, I'm sure there must be a cultural equivalent. I don't know what it is. But I'm sure there must be. So you can send your answers <laughs> on a postcard for wherever you're having your barbecue this afternoon. <laughs> okay. But the issue is a servant heart. It's the attitude of the heart. Now, in that culture, it was okay. You do it in our culture, it's just weird. 
Okay, just doesn't go in our culture. Okay, but anyway, uh, this is, is this is important uh, for us to do that. Verse twenty-five. She says, "Please pay no attention, my lord, to that wicked man Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my lord sent. And now, my lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives." And as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands. First of all, I think she probably knew about him not taking advantage of Saul in the cave. David had at least two occasions when David could have killed Saul and the men around him were saying, now's your opportunity. And they weren't just saying now is an opportunity to kill the king. They were saying, this is your divine moment. This is a moment that God has set up for you to take your rightful position. But David would not do the, uh, do the right thing in a wrong way. Yeah. It was right for him to be king, but he was not going to do it in a wrong way. And I think that's so important. Yes, so uh, Saul on one occasion was uh, relieving himself in a cave. And David goes up and he cuts uh, the hem of his gar- gar- garment. And after even just doing that, he feels regret. Yes? And then the second one is when they're all camped. And it's like the Lord puts them all into a deep sleep because he goes into the camp, into Saul's tent, with, uh, with Abner there, his chief commander, and they're all fast asleep. And, uh, and he takes Saul's, uh, Saul's spear. And the, the guy with him says to him, he says, look, if you just give me a chance, I'll put this through Saul. It won't need a repeat. It'll be one fell swoop and it'll be over and done. This is your, do you know what I mean? So Abigail understands, I think, at least one of these, if not both of these, that, that, that David is not one to do things in a wrong way. Yes, and, and, and what's on his things. And so she does what I would probably call, it's a bit like a mind Jedi trick on David. She says, she says since the Lord has stopped you, can you see how she's getting into the mind of David to help him to understand that? She's looking at a crazy madman and she's saying, but the Lord has stopped you. She's speaking into who he needs to be. Verse 26, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord. She is again giving him credit for being better than he was about to be. And I want to say to you, male or female, we need to speak into each other's futures. Not into how someone is responding at the moment. Yes? And try to to do that. And so what she was saying was, David, God's got a plan for your life. David, this is not the best for your life. David, you will regret this because where God's taking you, you don't want this as a mark on your testimony and on your life. Verse 28, because you fight, why? This is the reason why. Because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. She recognized that he was not an evil man. He was not like Nabal, her husband, who was, uh, who was uh, rough and harsh and abusive and, and, uh, and, and, you know, ungenerous. She understood that he was... But this verse 29, I think, is fascinating. Even though, she says, says this, even though someone, which of course is Saul, is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. Now, this is quite an unusual thing because if you're not fully aware of it, you can miss it if you just kind of run over it. It says that the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. What The phrase that's used here is talking about a wallet or a purse. 
So in them days, if you had something valuable, obviously usually money or whatever it was that you had valuable, you would, you would put it into this purse or this wallet or whatever, and you wrap it round, and then you would secure it to your belt. Yes? So that was the, the valuable. So this is basically what is happening here. So what she's saying is, even though somebody is trying to steal your life like a thief, she's trying to take what's in God's wallet, trying to take that, you must not do what you're doing. Yes? Even though you're going to, you've got to understand that even though it seems like this is going to happen, you've got to understand, David, that your life is wrapped up in God's wallet, in God's purse, and no one can touch you because you're strapped to God's belt. That's the imagery that's used here. I think it's powerful. Now, I don't know about you, but if I think of a woman's handbag, and, and this is probably, a, you know, I go with fear and trepidation. If Kath says to me, oh, it's in my handbag. Because I can search, and I can search, <laughs> and I can never, it's like going in to uh, Mary Poppins' handbag. It just kind of, or it's like going into a black hole, isn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? In other words, whatever's in there is pretty safe. It's not coming out, is it? You know, not if you want it anyway, you're not going to find it. Um, so I believe that this is, what he's, this is what she's saying to David. And I want to say this is what God is saying to every one of us today. He's saying, you are in my wallet. You're in my purse, you're in my handbag, and it's strapped to me. There's nobody getting to you because your, your life is bound up in God. And I think, that's not a powerful imagery? I think it's absolutely fantastic. And then she says this, verse 29, but the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. What is she referring to here? She's reminding him of the guy that he was when he was 15 years old, when he became the national hero. He became when he, he killed Goliath. And not only that, he has got Goliath's sword strapped to him. If ever there's an imagery there, and she's using this with wisdom and saying, but David, God is protecting you, and he will have you. He will, he will hurl your enemies away as in a sling. He know, God knows how to fire a sling. And he can be got stones in the sling that will make sure your enemies fall. And you should know this, David, because at 15 years of age, you trusted God with your sling to defeat a giant. Isn't that amazing? I think so, anyway. So she's speaking into David's future. And she asks, without asking, what story, David, do you want to tell? How do you want, when you are king, to be remembered? Do you want the slaughter of more innocent people on your head? Referring to ourselves, we would think, God is saying to us, do you want more of some of the things that you've already done and the, the, the consequences, do you want more of those consequences and life stories that really you don't want your children to know? You don't want other people to know. You don't want to be remembered for. So the question she's asking is, what story do you want to tell about this moment, David? Because this moment in time is a crucial, pivotal moment in time for you. And so she goes on, verse 30, When the Lord had fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him, and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord your God has brought my Lord success, remember your servant. And so David comes to his senses. The emotional temperature drops because of Abigail. And he says this to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him, 
and said, go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. Now, Abigail's very smart with what she does. Again, we see this right through. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet. It was celebration time. It was kind of big bonus time. And uh, like that of a king, he was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until daybreak. There are times to not say things. <laughs> yeah. Choose your time, yes. Then in the morning, which is a lot to be said about not tackling some things late at night, yes. Then in the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. His servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to you to, become, uh, to take you to become his wife. She bowed down with her face to the ground and said, I am your servant and I am ready to serve you and wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Abigail quickly got on a donkey and attended by her five female servants, went with David's messengers and became his wife. And they lived happily ever after. Well, probably not. She was wife number two. Although in some ways she was wife number three. And David did go back for wife, the first wife, so he ended up with three. So wherever there's more than one wife, there's going to be strife. <laughs> so let's summarize quickly, if you can manage to stay with me a little bit longer. We have three characters with three responses, but one hero. Nabal's as he, it was evil for good. David was evil for evil. And Abigail's was good for evil. She had a unique perspective. She looked through a different lens to everybody else. You see, Nabal, with his evil for good, nobody wanted to be like him. And David, the evil for evil, that's predictable. That's what we do. But Abigail, the good for evil, now that's remarkable. My question is, do you want to be predictable or do you want to be remarkable? You see, Abigail was ahead of her time. In the Old Testament, it was an eye for an eye. So David was, it's an eye for an eye. He's offended me, I'm going to offend him back. But in the New Testament... In the new covenant, it's different. Jesus turned all this upside down. So we see Abigail operating on a New Testament perspective. And Peter, who saw Jesus unjustly crucified, writing to persecuted Christians, in other words, these were Christians who were being mistreated, who were being abused, who insults and torture they suffered, he said this, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called. You're called to this. If you're a Christian, you are called to be a blessing. If you're a Christian, you're called to do good to those who do evil. If you are a Christian, you do not the predictable, but you do the remarkable. If you do that, and you don't, because if you're mistreated, for some people to think, well, I'll just not do anything. And they stay no neutral. They think, well, I'm not retaliating about it. I'm not doing evil for evil. I'm just not doing anything. Well, I want to say to you, that's good, but that's not God's best. You see, if you don't retaliate, that's called mercy. And God wants us to be merciful. But, but Jesus set the standard of not just mercy, but of grace. Great, you see, mercy is not getting what you deserve, but grace is getting what you don't deserve. And so for us, we need to have be people who realize we have received mercy. We haven't got what we deserve. 
but we have received grace from the Father. We get what we don't deserve, and therefore we need to respond to other people and to give what they don't deserve. They don't deserve maybe to be blessed and to have favor and for us to be good to them. But we are remarkable people. We are people who are not predictable but remarkable. And so I believe that we need to be like Peter. We need to be like Jesus. We need to be like Abigail. And so instead of evil for evil or just doing nothing, we need to be people who will do good to those who do evil, to those who mistreat us, to those who abuse us, to those who take advantage of us. Matthew 5 and verse 43 says this, You have heard that it was said. Jesus is talking to the Jews of the day, the people who understood they were living in the Old Testament covenant, the eye for an eye, and he said there, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was the Old Testament principle. But Jesus changes the paradigm. He changes the, the level of engagement. He changes what is the required uh, level for us as Christians to operate. And he says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. If you try to get even, you are just going to lower yourself to someone else's thing. But if you do good for evil, you are like your heavenly Father. You are reflecting the life of Jesus in you when you do good for evil. When you bless those and show favor and do good things to those who have done evil to you, I want to tell you, you have a different perspective in life. You are thinking of the king and you're not thinking of who you are. The Apostle Paul, as we were um, in our prayer time this morning that Tracy was leading, a real wonderful uh, time together in prayer. Uh, Tracy brought out about Galatians 2.20. And that's, that was Paul, and he says that, um, that I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. But the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. He died and gave himself for us. Jesus sets the standard. My question to you today, will you be like that? Will you be like Jesus? Will you live with that, with a different perspective to anybody else? or not a number of questions that I wanted to do which we'll look at in our connect groups but I'll just throw them out there before the first question is do you really want to be even with the people that you don't want to be even with you don't want to be like them yes I, I think even's easy but going ahead doing favour is better the second question is what story do you want to tell what do you want to be written about your life? Because God is writing your life in a book. And you, as we talked about in the second coming, everything that you do is either being rewarded or will be punished. And so we've got to understand that, yes? That we can build for that. But we play a story in our life and we need to change that story in our life. And the third question is, what would it look like for you to return good for evil? I think this is absolutely paramount. What would it look like for you in your specific circumstances, your situation, in your relationship, in, in whatever it is, what would it look like for you to do good for evil? What does it look like? Because your situation is specific. But you need to think that through and to think the person you're thinking, he said this, she did that, whatever it might be, yes? And the things that's going over in your, in your mind, I believe it's so important for you that you actually say, I'm going to be a, a person of grace. A person of mercy, but a person of grace. I'm going to do the extra mile. I'm going to go beyond, above and beyond. I'm not going to give people what they deserve. I'm going to go above and beyond. I, will you be like Abigail today? Or are you going to be like David? Or are you like Nabal? The question is only you can answer that and the choice is yours.